Uh, my name is Richard Rangham. I'm a professor of biological anthropology in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. And for the last 15 years, I have just been totally fascinated by this question. What has been the role of cooking in human evolution? I discovered that very little is known about the impact of cooking, and yet every culture in the world cooks its food, and culture is in many ways the signature feature of the human diet, and yet we have not known in a systematic way what cooking does to our food. And what we've found out in the last 15 years is that cooking has a number of important effects, but more important than any in our view is the fact that it systematically raises the net energy gain that you get from eating your food when it's cooked compared to when it's eaten raw. And there are two reasons for this. One is that it increases the proportion of the nutrients that you eat that you actually digest and absorb. And the other reason is that it reduces the energetic cost that your body pays to digest that food. And both of those reasons are important, and neither of them can yet be really said to be quantifiable. But we think that the kinds of differences that cooking makes to food are in the order more of 25, maybe even 40, 50 percent the, of the calories than, say, 5 or 10 percent. So this is hugely important. And one of the amazing things is that if you look up on the USDA website on the number of calories per gram of a food that has been prepared, cooked, compared to one, the same food that is eaten raw, what you will find is no acknowledgement of this difference. No acknowledgement of the fact that cooking actually gives you much more calories. The system that we use, we in this country and in almost every country in the world, is called the Atwater Convention for understanding how many calories you get per gram. That system pays no attention to food processing. It treats all foods as though processing doesn't matter at all. And so we have a very big problem, I think, in really understanding the effects of food processing. And think about this. Think about the fact that over the last 20, 50, 100 years, the number of calories per gram may be tremendously increased in the real way that you absorb your food because of food processing. The great industrial food companies process the food far more than was done in the recent decades. And that means that even though the labels may not have changed in the number of calories you are said to be receiving, in fact, you are receiving more calories than you did in the past. Uh, one of the consequences of our research is a, a solid conviction that raw foodism is not something that has been a feature of the human past. So this is surprising because most people would say to themselves, well, humans are animals and animals eat their foods raw, so humans must be able to eat our foods raw. And of course it's true that we can eat a lot of foods raw and raw food is emotionally, philosophically committed to doing so. And yet, nevertheless, we find that all the evidence is that humans are quite different from every other animal. Every other animal can eat its food raw and thrive on it. We can eat our food raw, but we do not thrive because we have adapted evolutionarily over a time period that we're not exactly sure about to absolutely needing to have our foods cooked. And the reason is, in terms of our bodies, that we have relatively small guts and uh, we do not uh, have the ability to process the fibers in particular that our fellow cousin apes can do very effectively. Now, what does this mean about today's world? It doesn't mean that raw foodism is a bad thing. It means that raw foodism is something you want to think about very carefully. If you are in danger of not getting enough calories, suppose you're trying to get pregnant, suppose that uh, you're, uh, you need a lot of energy to be able to counter disease, then you do not want to eat a raw food diet. If you're trying to lose weight, then a raw food diet is terrific. You've got to be a little bit careful about it. Uh, if it's vegan, you've got to make sure you get some vitamin B12. Uh, if it um, leads to any kind of back problems, you've got to be aware that uh, there is some evidence of uh, some uh, osteoporotic conditions with raw foodism. Uh, you've got to be aware that uh, homocysteine is sometimes elevated in raw foodists, which means uh, that's uh, an indication of uh, possible uh, cardiovascular problems. So you just want to be a little bit careful about it, but 
as long as you're a normal healthy person, a raw foodism uh, could be a terrific way for you to control your weight. Just don't think that this is something that represents the human past. It isn't. It's a novelty. It's a great novelty that you can use to control your own life. Raw foodists, of course, don't have many options for really high-density foods. Uh, the, the starchy foods that um, people who are eating cooked diets get a lot of their calories from are very poor in terms of calorie gain for a raw foodist. The, um, the, the foods that give you most dense calories are the nuts and seeds. Now, walnuts, almonds, hazelnuts, all the nuts, peanuts, um, they have their fats stored in ways that mean that they are a little bit less accessible if they have not been blended and if they have not been cooked. That's preliminary evidence on the cooked aspect and there's already a reasonably solid understanding of the blended aspect. What that means is that if you want to incorporate a lot of nuts and seeds into your diet, then you can expect to get less calories out of them if you eat them whole than if you eat them blended and cooked. This is an ongoing area of research. We don't know, again, how much the difference is going to be in terms of the number of calories you're going to get when you blend or cook compared to when you're eating them whole. But either way, they're going to be a terrific source of calories if you want calories as a raw foodist.